All right, greetings everyone and welcome to the uh, APOC Japan program webinar, The New Landscape of Economic Security and the US-Japan Alliance. My name is Kyoteru Tsutsui and I'm the director of the Japan program at the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center here at Stanford University. Uh, the term economic security or Keizai Anzen Hosho in Japanese has become an important foreign policy concept in Japan in recent years, uh, initially to counter China's rise in the region and now also in reaction to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And under this heading of economic security and economic statecraft, uh, policymakers and business leaders have been working to address thorny issues such as ensuring clean supply chains for Japanese corporations to avoid political fallouts, such as the one resulting from the issue of cotton from Xinjiang, China, uh, procuring all the semiconductors needed to produce the high-tech goods that Japan has to produce more of for its economy to regain its strength, uh, or securing energy in the world convulsed by sanctions against Russia, and protecting cutting edge technologies in sensitive areas such as military, artificial intelligence, and information and communication technology. Now, these efforts are complicated today by the complex webs of supply chains that cross national borders and growing dependencies of national economies, especially in a country like Japan that has always been dependent on international trade. And knowing all of these issues, the Japanese government has set off to develop a comprehensive policy and economic security as a guardrail against geopolitical disruption that might continue to arise in the more unsettled security environment that we live in. Would these legislative measures be effective? If not, what more should be done by policymakers, business leaders, and the general public? And how would Japan's efforts intersect with the efforts by the US and other like-minded nations as the United States government works to flesh out the contents of the proposed Indo-Pacific Economic Framework as a part of its integrated deterrence scheme? Uh, to answer these questions and more, we are very fortunate to have two leading experts on those issues. Let me introduce them briefly. Our first speaker is Kazuto Suzuki, uh, who is a professor of science and technology policy at the Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Tokyo. He's also a senior fellow of Asia Pacific Initiative, an independent policy think tank in Japan. He received much of his academic training in Europe, having received a, uh, earned a PhD from University of Sussex in England, and then worked as a researcher in France. And since then, he has taught at the University of Tsukuba and then Hokkaido University, before arriving at the University of Tokyo in 2020. Um, he has published widely and appeared on various uh, media outlets. And his most recent book, Space and International Politics, has won the prestigious Santori Prize for Social Sciences and Humanities. And relevant to the topics for today, he served as an expert in the panel of experts for the Iranian Sanction Committee under the United Nations Security Council from 2013 to July 2015. And he's currently on a number of uh, Japanese government committees, including the one that's working on a guideline for protection of human rights in supply chains, as well as the Committee on Semiconductors and Businesses. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Miria Salis, who is director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies and Philip Knight Chair in Japan Studies, also a senior fellow or at the, uh, in the foreign policy program at Brookings Institution. An expert on Japanese foreign poli uh, economic policy, uh, US-Japan relations, international trade policy, and Asia-Pacific economic integration, Dr. Salis has published a number of scholarly books and also offered a number of policy, influential policy analysis. In her most recent book, Dilemmas of a Trading Nation, Japan and the United States in the Evolving Asia-Pacific Order, offers a novel analysis of the complex trade-offs Japan, uh, Japan and the United States face in drafting trade policy that seeks to reconcile the goals of economic competitiveness, social legitimacy, and political viability. And this book, Dilemmas of a Trading Nation, received the renowned Masayoshi Ohira Memorial Award in 2018. Um, so we will start with uh, Suzuki Sensei first, but uh, and then Miria's uh, commentary. Uh, but before moving to our discussion, um, we um, start this session with a very, very heavy heart. As uh, some of you know, um, the very sad news of the passing untimely 
passing of uh, our, our friend and colleague, uh, Toshihiro Nakayama, professor at Keio University, uh, was just announced. And um, he was a dear friend and colleague to all of us, all three of us. And uh, we'd like to take a moment of silence and then um, just talk briefly about um, to honor his memories and legacy. So if you could uh, join us in taking a, um, a few seconds of moment of silence, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we really need to uh, compose ourselves, but uh, uh, just to share my memories with him. He, um, I've known him for something like 15 years. Uh, I first met him through a, a US Japan leadership program and um, he was just a joy to be with always. Um, uh, he's a smart and intellectual um, intellectually very sophisticated person, but also a, a really fun, charming, and stylish person. Um, and it's fun to talk to him, not just about US Japan relations, but also about um, music and fashion and uh, all those kinds of uh, uh, hobbies that we shared. And he uh, visited, when I was at the University of Michigan, he visited and gave a talk and we spent a day together hanging out in Detroit. I remember showing him around in an interesting um, neighborhood uh, that's interesting for American um, sort of domestic policy. Um, and also we went to the Ford Museum together. Um, I have a photo of him and me and him sitting on, uh, on the bus that Rosa Parks uh, uh, sat on. Um, and he very recently, he had a really a uh, nice tweet about about myself and I I meant to I don't do tweets so I didn't I did Twitter I don't so I didn't really uh, return any uh, comments in in Twitter and I meant to thank him for his warm comments about me and my work and I now don't have that opportunity so um, um, so my message to all of you is to have your loved ones and thank everyone that you need to to thank uh, when you have a chance. Um, so thank you, Toshi, we'll always remember you. Um, so Zixin said, would you like to maybe say a few words? Yeah, um, yeah, Toshi has been a friend of mine for the last 20 years or more. Uh, we met when he was, uh, well, he's now very stylish, but you know, when we met in two decades ago, he was, uh, he shaved his hair and he wore the sunglasses and uh, he was uh, both uh, an academics on the American studies and the most renowned and very young, fresh uh, researcher, but he was also a DJ at the Roppongi and uh, he was, um, uh, he he was just astonishing in in many sense. Not just uh, his intellectual, but uh, his style, his way of living, and and his family. And you know, uh, we had the um, we had a meeting, regular meeting, almost every uh, every month. And um, and we uh, we we shared and we appeared in the same TV shows and all of that uh, we had you know he was a great companion uh, to discuss with and uh, he was a uh, uh, most reliable person to come to when we talk about what's going on in the united states particularly during the trump administration he was the sort of a uh, academic anchor i mean he was the public intellectual to tell what's going on in the united states and um, and i think it it gives us the sense of assurance that you know uh, we at least understand through the Toshi Toshi's um, uh, perspective and through Toshi's understanding uh, about the United States. And I think he was also very uh, influential in the policy making. He was a, a 
he was a, a, a academic advisor to the Ministry of Defense, and uh, he he had this um, uh, public role to to shape the Japanese um, policies. So I think it is a great loss for um, Japan and the United States, and I think uh, we are now lost a. Uh, a sort of a compass of uh, how to see, how to navigate in this uh, very turbulent time. And I, uh, and I, I, you know, we all miss him and I miss him. It's a, uh, it's a very sad moment. Uh, um, yeah, I, th I think um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really hard to put it in, in the words, how much, how appreciate uh, I am and, uh, how how um, how wonderful the time that uh, we spend all together. So, thank you, Toshi, and uh, and rest in peace. Thank you, Mireya. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, and thank you, uh, Kiyo, for having us uh, for having me here at this uh, program. And thank you also for uh, starting with this very important remembrance of uh, Toshi Nakayama a uh, very dear friend, uh, admired scholar. Um, I met Toshi almost 10 years ago when I first joined uh, Brookings. And uh, Toshi actually had been a visiting fellow at Brookings before my time there. I know that he left a deep mark on my colleagues. Everybody remembered him very uh, fondly. And Toshi always stay in touch with all of us. We have a saying that once you're part of the Brookings family, you're always a uh, family. And, we all felt very close uh, to Toshi and, um, you know, I interacted with him many times. Um, I, I found him always thoughtful, insightful, articulate, very generous with his uh, time, always willing to join in conferences, in events, and always a pleasure uh, to be around. And, you know, I think that uh, Toshi in particular um, could explain uh, to the Japanese public what has been happening in the United States. And that was a great service uh, given uh, all the um, recent um, developments in the United States. And you know, I, I, the way I think of this is that really we lost a light in the US-Japan uh, community. And I think that that only motivates us more to um, sort of work to try to um, honor his legacy. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll now, um, with that, we'll move on to our discussion uh, of economic security, because that's what Toshi would have liked us to do and to, to hear our conversation. Um, so let's start with uh, uh, Suzuki Sensei's uh, opening presentation remarks, if you could. Uh... Sure. Um, so let me just uh, start sharing uh, a slides of, um... So as uh, as Kiyo mentioned, uh, I, I have been in the, involved in the uh, various uh, government meetings uh, for shaping up this uh, uh, economic security and uh, 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 the bill of uh, it. It's not directly related to the bill, but uh, the general um, essence of the economic security uh, policies in Japan. And uh, I just uh, try to give you the sort of a uh, general. Uh, uh, general briefings and the uh, remarks of uh, what's going on and how this come about as a Japanese new uh, uh, security strategy. Uh, perhaps you may know that uh, Japan is now uh, redrafting the uh, national security strategy and the national uh, guidance for the defense procurement, uh, defense planning and and all these. Uh, this is an year of the um, a dynamic shift of the national security uh, policies. So um, it, is, uh, it is almost certain that the economic security is going to be a part of this uh, uh, revise and the uh, revision and, 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 and the redrafting of the uh, security, uh, national security documents. So um, the, the background of this, uh, um, uh, why Japan is now working on this uh, economic security is that, first of all, it's, it's historical. Japan, after World War II, has been the, uh, a beneficial 
beneficiary of the liberal international order and uh, free trade. But in the macro historical perspective, the free trade was created among the countries which share the values, uh, you know, uh, the Western countries. Although the um, uh, Soviet Union was a part of the uh, Bretton Woods meeting, but uh, soon after, you know, it left and then the free trade was uh, becoming as a Western, uh, Western framework of economic, economic order. Um, but the, when the Cold War was over, the you know, accession of China and Russia and other non-Western countries created a complexity of the division between the security and economy. Before that, the economy and the security were not the, in the conflict. Although, you know, Japan and the United States had uh, uh, trade friction in, during 1980s, but even that is the period that, uh, you know, there was an economic uh, conflict, but there was no security conflict. So it was basically um, a, uh, the, uh, within the framework of the Western allies. Uh, but today, the situation is completely different because you have the economic integrated economic uh, supply chain and economic uh, exchanges, but there are uh, uh, contradictions and a, a conflict between the uh, between the states. So, the the balance between the economic rationality and the security interest has not really uh, mending each other. Uh, the <clears throat> On the economic rationality, uh, trading with with China and depending on the Russian resources seems to be very rational because they are, you know, they provide the most efficient, most cheap uh, uh, services and and goods. And but at the same time, depending on these economic uh, economic services, uh, means that there will be a, a security risks. And that is apparent in the Russian sanctions, which I'm going to talk about later. But um, the Russian sanctions is, the, is a typical case that the economic connection is now uh, uh, preventing the taking the security actions, uh, such as the economic sanctions. So this uh, time, the, the connection of the economic, uh, well, the integration of the economic sphere and the division in the, in the political sphere is creating the situation that people, uh, you know, the states using uh, trade as a weapon. The, the dependence and vulnerability is the leverage to impose the political will and the values. So this is on the way, uh, you know, Japan experienced in 2010 that when there was a uh, uh, a clash of the fishing boat and the uh, uh, and the coastal guard uh, vessels in of Japan and the Chinese fishing boat. Uh, the Japanese coast guard has arrested the captain of the fishing boat, and the uh, China has used the economic uh, sanctions, um, the trade ban of the rare earth mineral to Japan, uh, that created the. Uh, uh, lesson that gave the lesson that Japan should not depend heavily on on, on China for the critical uh, critical minerals critical uh, items the other weaponization uh, method used by China is the using the market gravity the China is the uh, second largest economy and it has a huge market and uh, there are many countries, including uh, Taiwan, Australia, and many other countries in Asia, depends heavily on the Chinese market as the destination of the export. And China often use the size of market as the leverage to impose certain political a willingness or values to other countries. Taiwan, of course, you know, uh, uh, prohibiting uh, imports of the pineapples uh, from Taiwan was one of the uh, one of the example. You know, prohibiting the Australian wines and uh, and agriculture and coal um, had uh, had certain impact on the relationship between the Australia and China. 
So in general, this uh, uh, weaponization of trade, uh, weaponization of trade uh, has means that there is a political intervention in economy and sacrificing the economic benefit for the political purposes. So again, the political purpose uh, is often used, uh, often being prioritized to the um, economic benefit. And uh, that creates the sort of the um, ambivalent situation for the businesses in those countries. And also imposing the economic sanctions also have the negative effect on its own economy. For example, what is happening in Europe, the, you know, they can't really put the sanctions on the Russian energies because if you stop importing the Russian energy, uh, Russian gas and oil, then it will have the negative, huge impact on negative impact on the European economy. So uh, there is always a necessity for the government to exercise the uh, this economic statecraft. The government has to have the legitimate uh, reasons for imposing such sanctions, and uh, such sanctions is. Uh, of course, given, uh, you know, to large extent, there will be an impact on the business and society on your own country. But if you have some particular um, uh, political importance of imposing such sanctions, then it has to have the, um, uh, it has to convince the uh, business and society to the, um, uh, to, to the, uh, 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 to the community uh, uh, within the country. <clears throat> then the, Jap the current Japan's uh, proposed bill, which has passed the lower house bill and which is now uh, under the deliberation of the uh, upper house. Uh, uh, this bill is talking about the comprehensive economic security and it has a four pillar in, 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 in the bill. Uh, first is the supply chain resilience to uh, to shape to limit the uh, the items which are designated as the strategically critical items, and the these items should be controlled by the government or, or should be monitored by the government to whether we have we have over dependence on one certain countries, particularly on China. The second pillar is the protection of the critical infrastructure. Again, the government will uh, inspect uh, and monitor the procurement process of the uh, of the critical infrastructure and its uh, installations. That the these uh, critical infrastructures will not use the uh, 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 parts and and systems and softwares which are imported from the countries of concerns. And the third pillar is the concealed patents. This is the another side of the economic security, which is to limit the uh, erosion of the uh, Japanese technological advantages. So the patents uh, are usually open, but the Japan didn't have this um, framework of the concealing the patent information so that the uh, other countries were able to, um, to, to look the technical uh, specificities of the new technologies. So the Japanese government tried to, uh, to limit the, uh, the openness of the technological specificities of the new technologies so that we can maintain the techni technological advances. The, the fourth pillar is the promotion of science and technology basis. This is to focus on the, uh, particularly the dual use technologies, um, which can be uh, promoted for the civilian purposes, but also can be used for the military purposes, particularly the emerging technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence, biotechnologies, robotics, 3D printings, etc. So, um, Japan is, uh, of course, Japan is uh, is a global player in this field, but there was a, a sort of a disjointment or disjunction of the 
uh, academics and the military. So the government is trying to, to mend these fences and try to have more, uh, more smooth communication between the military and academics to exchange the technical information and how the military can, be, can use the uh, technology which are developed in the civilian field. So in general, this uh, Japanese new proposed bill uh, on the economic security is uh, in general has the uh, characteristics of the defensive nature. Um, there is an assumption that the, uh, the China is exercising uh, the economic statecraft in 2010 on the rare earth mineral uh, to Taiwan pineapple and, uh, and uh, uh, against Australia on the coal and the agriculture and wine. So there are very uh, clear focus on this intentional use of the economic statecraft. And this is quite different from what is discussed in the United States on the uh, supply chain resi resilience, for example. In the United States, people are talking about the supply chain resilience uh, because of the, you know, the natural disaster, the, you know, the tornado, etc. Uh, and then, if there is a natural uh, the disturbance of the supply chain, then you need to have the resilience. But in Japan. The, of course, we do have the uh, natural disasters, and there are often uh, the breakdown of the supply chain because of that. But at the same time, I think this bill is focusing on the not those natural causes, but the intentional causes. So that means that that is why the uh, idea of the economic security, so security, brings up into this word because it's more about you know, uh, to defend ourselves from the intentional um, pressure or intentional uh, attack uh, using the economic, economic means, not the military means, but the economic means. And the government is trying to convince the business that this is a security matter, therefore. Um, and it is certainly the, impose, the, the implementation of this new bill will have, the, uh, have a problem of this uh, limitation for the um, uh, free activities of the businesses. And the business is, um, is facing that difficulties so that um, <clears throat> Japan is trying to, uh, to impose, uh, the Japan try, needs to convince that this is a security matter. Therefore, the, government, uh, the businesses have to limit itself. And uh, interestingly, the businesses agrees upon the Japanese approaches, but it is demanding more flexibility and transparency and openness for the US measures, because the United States also takes uh, various measures for investment like CFIUS, et cetera. So uh, it seems that the, there are a lot of the uh, uh, economic security measures in the United States, such as Buy American Act, uh, as a protectionist measures. So the, these are the other issues which pops up after, you know, while we are discussing in this uh, 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 economic security bill. And uh, the th third point I'd like to make is that there should be a difference between the economic security and economic statecraft. The economic security is about the defensive measures, how to protect the Japan from the you know, attack from other countries by economic means. The economic statecraft is an attack to other countries using the economic means. So the Japan is not pre preparing for the economic attack or using the economic statecraft. It is more for the defensive measures to protect the Japan, Japanese economy from the uh, uh, foreign, uh, foreign in, in, uh, intentional uh, attacks. Um, just sim uh, because of the time, I'll just uh, make it quick. The um, uh, Japan's approach on the Russian sanctions uh, what is interesting is the second bullet, the legal constraints. Japan doesn't have the legal means to impose its own sanctions. Japanese uh, legal instruments such as uh, uh, foreign exchange and foreign trade law only happens when there is a co uh, international coordination. So if there is no UN Security Council sanctions, 
or the G7 agreement that there will be no Japanese sanctions. So this case in uh, Russian sanctions, the G7 has the very uh, aggressive and ex extensive uh, sanctions measures. So Japan is following that, but uh, it, is, uh, um, it is difficult if Japan takes the lead to uh, impose sanctions. And this is a very interesting because the Kishida is now pushing this economic sanctions very effectively and very swiftly. Uh, unlike Abe sanctions in 2014, because the Abe had the, um, had the other strategy to negotiate and to, uh, uh, to co cooperate with Russia uh, in order to facilitate the discussion for the uh, territorial issue in the Northern Islands. And uh, finally, I like to make the, uh, the final point is that the Japan is, uh, is learning the issue of this Russian sanctions as the question of the risks of dependency, because the Japan is depending, you know, less than 5% of the oil and less than 8% uh, of the gas, but uh, still we depend on Russia and the dependency creates the difficulties for imposing sanctions. And therefore, the, uh, the diversification of the supplies and diversification of the uh, uh, trade is considered to be the most uh, important and a very high, uh, high priority for the Japanese, uh, Japanese economy. And in that sense, the imposing sanctions, which is the economic statecraft and economic securities uh, is now linked with the concept uh, uh, of this uh, dependency. And the Japan is very much aware of the importance that we, even though Japan is dependent on, the, uh, on oil and, and gas and everything about the energy, uh, but this is creating the situation uh, that we have to have more careful and, uh, and more strategic approach to the uh, energy security, as well as uh, the supply chain. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Suzuki Sensei. Now to Dr. Salis. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, that was a great presentation. I learned a lot from it. And then let me offer just some very uh, brief set of remarks that touch on some of the issues that uh, Suzuki Sensei already mentioned, and then maybe add a little bit more on the US perspective on uh, the US-Japan cooperation when it comes to economic security. And just for the purpose of um, clarity, I'm going to use a term economic statecraft, a little bit different that, uh, from what uh, Professor Suzuki used it, um, because I used it in a broader way, uh, the use of economic tools to achieve foreign policy objectives. And uh, uh, you know there are the instances of Chinese economic coercion uh, that uh, Professor Suzuki was referring to, and I think that's a very important part of the story. And also, of course, sanctions policy, especially um, in the aftermath or during the uh, current Ukraine uh, crisis. But, but in general, I would say that Japan's economic statecraft has actually kicked into high gear in the past few years. And there is a promotion side, the connectivity side, that I think that that's where Japan really cut its teeth first. And now what we're seeing is the uh, increasing importance of the defensive side or the risk hedging uh, and the resilience agenda. So um, I think that you know, for a very long time, we used to think of Japan as a very passive player when it came to um, foreign economic policy and particularly trade policy. And there is nothing uh, uh, far farther from the truth today. Japan is actually a very proactive and influential actor in the international trading system. And I think this speaks to uh, how much uh, uh, the Japanese government has been able to increase its stature. And now it's uh, you know, uh, very much shaping mega trade agreements. It was first the comprehensive and progressive uh, TPP, but also uh, the Japan-EU trade agreement, and more recently, the regional comprehensive economic partnership agreement that includes China and is uh, the world's largest trade agreement. Again. We used to think that Japan could not negotiate because of domestic political constraints, ambitious trade agreements. We actually see now Japan very proactively uh, partaking in these negotiations. There is a other part of uh, foreign economic policy that has to do with infrastructure finance, 
And again, if you think about the situation in Asia, most people focus exclusively on the Belt and Road Initiative, but in fact, Japan has been long been a very important player in infrastructure uh, finance and uh, uh, provides alternatives to many developing countries in Asia so that they just don't have one source of uh, funds to uh, tackle these large scale infrastructural projects. And I think that's also been remarkable to see Japan pay such a, a priority to digital diplomacy, to the codification of rules as part of trade agreements, but in other formats as well, to try to promote uh, open uh, digital ecosystem at a time when we actually are seeing um, rising digital protectionism and when there is a concern that we'll see fragmentation on the governance of the uh, digital uh, space. So I think that it's clear then that there's been this push, a more proactive Japan, a more consequential Japan when it comes to this connectivity agenda. But what brings us uh, here today is this other new major endeavor uh, where we see um, Japanese uh, policymakers more concerned with um, uh, a riskier uh, external environment and therefore uh, worried about trade protectionism, worried about the strategic uh, rivalry, worried about competition on the um, high tech uh, sectors. And I think that has uh, brought a desire to recalibrate uh, Japanese foreign economic policy and to develop new tools um, uh, that have to do with uh, risk hedging. Um, and, uh, you know, they already uh, Suzuki Sensei mentioned the main components of the bill that's under uh, consideration and that uh, we're paying close attention to uh, how that uh, bill is going to be um, implemented. But before the bill, there already been some important uh, moves uh, on this front. Uh, for example, Japan now has introduced national security to um, review uh, foreign direct investment uh, into the country. And in the middle of the pandemic, um, the Abe government also uh, initiated these subsidies to try to strengthen uh, the supply chain. And I think that the main concern there was overdependence uh, on China. So um, if I can just briefly talk about um, what I see some of the major drivers that are then uh, creating a strong incentive in Japan and other governments um, to try to uh, boost up these uh, set of defensive economic measures, I think I would highlight three main um, uh, factors here that I think are really important in trying to understand the current juncture and why it is that economic security has become such an important uh, policy uh, issue. Uh, first of all, I think we have to uh, pay attention to uh, great power competition and the strategic rivalry between the United States and uh, China, um, because I think that this has increased uh, concerns with the relative gains from economic exchange. And I think that in the United States has been a very uh, thorough uh, rethink on um, the best approach towards China. I think that uh, the policy of engagement has uh, lost some uh, support and uh, there is a strong um, um, bipartisan concern about whether um, China indeed can uh, um, uh, uh, be a more responsible stakeholder, skepticism about that proposition, skepticism that the WTO can provide uh, the necessary rules to create a level playing field. Uh, so I think that that's uh, central to understand uh, the current um, uh, moment in time. I also think a very important uh, trend uh, is that we're in the midst of a technological uh, revolution and that we now see um, a suite of new technologies that are very much changing economies and societies. It's artificial intelligence, it's 5G, it's quantum computing, advanced uh, semiconductor manufacturing, uh, etc. And this has therefore raised the competitive stakes because uh, some people refer to these as platform technologies, which will become more central to economic competitiveness and military uh, readiness. And therefore, the protection of these critical technologies and the uh, infrastructure around them has increased in importance. And I think this is very much reflected in the economic deal that uh, is under consideration uh, in Japan. And finally, I would also say that the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated these trends. 
And uh, in the way I refer to this is that in many ways has put a mirror to a very ugly reality, and that is the increase of economic uh, nationalism. And when we see how many governments have responded to the pandemic, we've seen, for example, um, export restrictions on personal protection equipment, on uh, vaccines, as well as uh, growing calls to re-nationalize uh, production. Um, in many cases, making the case that onshoring of manufacturing uh, is the best avenue to try to address some of these uh, vulnerabilities. So I would say that we see uh, increasingly that self-reliance has increased uh, its appeal, but I think that it's very important to understand that uh, this is not really a penchant for or a desire for autarky because after all, autarky would reduce uh, uh, influence, international influence would diminish national power. I think uh, instead that some of the major players in the international system are aiming to strengthen their domestic capabilities and lead in high tech frontiers while encouraging economic dependence uh, from others. Uh, and therefore the way in which I think of uh, the current international system is that we're transitioning or we're in the middle of a system that perhaps we should describe as hard-edged edge, hard edged interdependence or independence, interdependence with um, sharp um, elbows. So um, a, I would say that this presents a new balancing act, especially for a country like Japan that had become so proactive and so adept in its connectivity agenda and then now bringing these suit of other tools to address the question of economic uh, security. And I see uh, this as a balancing act because I do think that economic connectivity and economic security are in many ways motivated by different factors and therefore reconciling them is not always going to be uh, easy. When we talk, for example, about economic connectivity, we're thinking about, you know, the objective is to increase um, greater interdependence, greater economic exchange to generate growth, to generate wealth, to tap on the sources of comparative advantage. And to do so, frequently governments agree to sign, for example, trade agreements to abide by international rules. They agree to buy their hands and therefore let these efficiency uh, considerations drive a lot of that cross-border economic exchange. And uh, also we see, for example, in trade agreements, uh, uh, the uh, existence of third-party um, uh, dispute settlement mechanisms. And therefore you have established process to address any potential disagreements. Now, when we think about economic security, I think that the goal here is resilience, risk reduction. And in fact, uh, states frequently uh, try to expand their own discretion in, uh, you know, invoking national security controls to restrict international economic transactions by uh, making the case that they pose a very uh, serious risk uh, to uh, the country. And I think also there is uh, um, an inclination to emphasize, uh, to provide advantages to domestic industry because in this world of economic security, the location of manufacturing is of growing uh, relevance. So what I see here, and this is not just specific to Japan, but I think it's important when I try to understand how economic security is coexisting with high levels of already existing economic integration, is that you can think of the uh, tension, the pool between integration and international rules on the one hand and autonomy and sovereign control um, on the other. So um, let me then, uh, transition and talk a little bit about um, in this world where uh, uh, we see economic security becoming a much larger policy priority for many governments. Uh, what are the implications of this for the US-Japan agenda? And how does, the, uh, how does Japan's economic security agenda look uh, from uh, the vantage point of the United States? And I'll just offer some very um, brief reflections so that we can have uh, ample time for a conversation and uh, conversation with all of you. So um, I do think that uh, the rise um, of economic security uh, points to a very broad convergence between the United States and uh, Japan when it comes to uh, the China challenge. And I do think that the economic security agenda is in many ways motivated by um, 
by China and by uh, um, you know, the rise of uh, China, the uh, recommitment to a state capitalism uh, model, um, the skepticism again that the WTO can actually make a difference in trying to create a level uh, playing field. And the fact that China is now using uh, its industrial policy to try to um, uh, climb uh, the uh, ladder and uh, uh, increase its own resilience on the high tech um, uh, sector. Uh, but it also has to do, as uh, I think was very also very clear from Suzuki Sensei's remarks, with uh, China's predation practices and the increasing resort to economic uh, coercion. And uh, therefore, uh, this creates, of course, a sense of vulnerability and the desire to avoid overdependence uh, on China. So I do think that when it comes to fleshing out uh, some of the main uh, uh, elements of the uh, China challenge, I think that the United States and Japan do share a broad understanding. But having said that, I don't think that we should assume that the uh, um, China policies of the United States and Japan are identical. In fact, I think that there are some significant uh, differences, even though both governments are adopting increasingly defensive economic uh, measures, uh, the screening of foreign direct investment, tightened export controls, supply chain resilience efforts. Those are all areas that are now front and center on the bilateral agenda, and they offer opportunities for coordination, and that's very important. But I think I would also be remiss if I don't point out to what I see are some important differences. Um, for example, uh, Japan has not resorted to across the board tariffs as an effective tool uh, uh, to deal with China, because I actually think that what we have seen in the US-China um, dynamic is that the tariffs, the 301 tariffs have not been effective. And actually Japan also has not resorted to a managed trade approach as we've seen in the US-China uh, phase one trade agreement, where one of the objectives was to get a commitment from China to uh, purchase an additional $200 billion worth of American products, a commitment that has not been uh, fulfilled. I also think that there's been some disquiet uh, in the Japanese private sector about very broad uh, and unilateral uh, tech restrictions imposed uh, by the United States in the past. Uh, towards um, China. And I would also say that um, my perception is that Japan still has greater faith in the global supply chain than uh, in, that the United States seems to have, certainly uh, 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 in policymaking uh, circles. And therefore, uh, when you see how Japan is dealing with the uh, supply chain resilience challenges, it's not just talking about purely onshoring, there is no uh, push for a purely by Japan agenda the way we see uh, in the United States. And in fact, it, uh, an important component of what Japan is trying to do has to do with diversification and with making sure that uh, overdependence with China is corrected also by uh, relocating some of uh, that manufacturing capability elsewhere um, in Asia. So, um, and uh, my final point where I do see a big difference between Japan and the United States is that um, Japan is still a strong believer in the merits and the value of a comprehensive trade agreement such as the CPTPP. And unfortunately, um, um, you know, uh, the United States does not seem yet able to find its way back to the TPP. The CPTPP, the Biden administration uh, is not interested um, in it and instead has uh, um, announced that it should be launching soon an Indo-Pacific economic framework um, that is not going to have market access as part of um, uh, the proposal. And therefore it's going to deal with uh, supply chain resilience, with the digital economy, with um, uh, anti-corruption and taxes, with infrastructure and decarbonization, but it's not clear whether it's going to be uh, compelling enough if it does not put the connectivity uh, uh, element front and center through uh, market uh, integration. And therefore, and this is where I end, um, I would say that there is a big difference between how Japan and the United States are navigating the question of economic security in the sense that Japan seems to have a much more balanced approach in the sense that it has a very strong connectivity push and then it's trying to address some of those challenges through the uh, um, 
those risks through the economic security um, uh, portfolio, where the United States looks like it's mostly working on the defensive side and it's really struggling to offer that connectivity uh, uh, or economic engagement agenda that also would be uh, critical for the United States to remain very influential in the Indo-Pacific region. So let me stop here for now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, both of you, for uh, offering these uh, incredibly insightful remarks about the state of economic security and economic statecraft in Japan. Um, the, the audience, please um, submit uh, your question. I already see uh, a number of them coming in. I'm, I'm going to try to integrate them. But let me start with one quick question about the current uh, the law that's about to pass in the Japanese diet. Um, and you know, the, the law, as Mireya said, um, Japan has been very um, active in uh, setting trade laws, frameworks, uh, rules, and this economic security law is part of that, uh, uh, those efforts by the Japanese government. And it's, it's generally a, a constructive um, approach, uh, it seems to me, but the devil's always in, the, in those details, right? And then as we think about, uh, for instance, the um, uh, resilience in supply chains, um, the strategical, strategically critical items, so what would be designated as such uh, plays a critical role. And in thinking about the, the process, the lobbying by the industry, connections with whatever METI and the government officials, um, I, I would imagine there's some concern that, um, as Miria said, uh, kind of economic nationalism and protectionism, um, uh, might come back in a different, uh, in a new form. Um, so how, how what, what measures are being taken to um, protect from that kind of at least perception? Um, and we, you know, not, people are talking about semiconductors uh, or sometimes masks, I guess masks are not going to be designated in that category anymore. Uh, but you know, those things are fine to talk about, but if, if something like rice comes in, uh, in the, uh, under the heading of, food security, um, and, and how do we discuss all these issues and, and what, what is being discussed in the government right now? Um, and when the guidelines or, or, uh, or laws uh, uh, come, what kind of obligations would corporations have? Uh, that would also play an important role. Is it going to be more of a soft target, aspirational goals? to be achieved in five, 10 years, or is it a binding law that would uh, constrain corporate uh, behaviors uh, right off the bat? Uh, and those things are going to be quite important uh, for this new, uh, these new efforts to uh, become effective in achieving economic security without harming the market. Um, so if you could each um, discuss that briefly, that would be great. Uh, maybe Suzuk Sensei to start. Right, so uh, yes, the devil's in details, and uh, this is the uh, this is the bill that is talk that we are talking about, and this is how thick, and it's it has more than uh, three hundred pages. So uh, I can't really discuss in detail, but uh, there are uh, certain uh, decisions and uh, procedures are already uh, embedded in this uh, in this bill. Uh, for example, yes, the uh, strategic uh, the it, the strategic critical items are not yet determined, but it it is more uh, almost certain that the, the semiconductor will be in it. The medical equipment as well as uh, rare earth minerals, etc., are going to be in. Um, and uh, I, I think the well the for the businesses the. This is a binding uh, legal measures. So what business needs to do is first to uh, submit the information which are requested from the government to analyze the, uh, the, the supply chain as such. So this is one of the big problem uh, because it is very intrusive and uh, and the business doesn't want to share the, you know, some sort of a trade secret about, you know, who they are dealing with and, uh, you know, which suppliers they are uh, they are working with. So uh, generally, this is voluntary, but uh, it, it has a very uh, sort of a forceful uh, 
uh, implication that the uh, business have to cooperate with the with the government in the name of the, sec the economic security. The um, issues with regard to the critical infrastructure, this is more intrusive that the, uh, the um, government, uh, the suppliers which are designated 14 sectors, including gas, electricity, uh, railways, the uh, airlines, etc. You know, this 14 uh, designated uh, industry has to submit the uh, procurement plans for their critical uh, systems that is uh, designated in this bill to uh, to announce which vendors that they de they are going to to uh, to depend with and then it needs the, uh, some sort of an approval by the government uh, in negotiation with those uh, companies and operators uh, to make sure that you know the, these items are and the, the government will do the background check of the uh, the items that has certain you know the uh, uh, history of the uh, of the uh, mal behavior of the in 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 the system so Basically, this is to uh, reduce the risks of the foreign intervention and to monitor by the government for the economic activities on the certain items and certain infrastructure and to make sure that these risks will be mitigated by this double check, triple check through the government. If that's uh, I, I don't know if the, if I answer your question, but uh, that's uh, that's how I, I can see it. Great. Mireya, anything? Uh, yeah, just let me add a little bit. Um, that was a great answer already, but, you know, um, I think that for this to work, hopefully, um, it would be a very disciplined designation of what actually counts as essential to national security. We don't want any willy-nilly uh, designation, right? So I think that it's very helpful that there's going to be a process built in to this bill to identify which products, which sectors do require this special uh, scrutiny, because I think that when it comes to supply chain resilience, also what um, many governments want is greater insight on how those supply chains are built. And in order to be able to uh, tackle uh, before we are experiencing very severe shortages like we just did on the, the semiconductors. The idea is that we're better off if we understand where the vulnerabilities may lie. So although that's very understandable from the point of view of the private sector, this is a new level of uh, intervention of surrendering of um, data and they're not particularly happy uh, in the context of the United States. For example, um, a few months ago, the Biden administration asked um, semiconductor companies to release some of this information and they did very uh, grudgingly. So again, I think that we're going to see that boundary between uh, the state and the private sector be readjusted and the, the government is asking for more information on how these corporations are run. On the other side, um, there is perhaps the, uh, the carrot that some subsidies could be coming um, their way. Uh, but then there's going to be competition uh, for those uh, subsidies. And it will be interesting to see, um, you know, if more uh, governments begin to award subsidies, um, then whether there will not be complaints about a subsidy raise. So I think that that's also something we should be watching for. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to questions from the audience. And there's a, a bunch of questions about um, diversification. I think that that's one critical issue, um, China plus one type of thinking. And um, one very concrete, a uh, couple of very concrete questions. Uh, Christine Vacassi asks about um, Japanese multinational corporations maybe needing, um, if they tend to be more reluctant to reshore uh, their production to Japan. So is there any um, uh, government support or incentive that is being offered, uh, it kind of kind of connects with President Biden's um, um, middle, you know, um, build back better kind of agenda uh, similar to this middle class uh, rebuilding efforts. That's one question about whether the 
the government, Japanese government support for bringing production back to Japan. Uh, another question is uh, from Shun Fukuyasan, uh, Fukuyasan sorry, uh, asking about the role of South Korea. Um, semiconductor is very important. Taiwan is wonderful. But in the case of Taiwan contingency, we need Japan needs some alternative. Uh, and South Korea could emerge as a very viable alternative candidate for an alternative. But as we know, South Korea Japan relationship is uh, not wonderful right now. So what can we do uh, in that area? Uh, then if I could bunch, uh, uh, add another one from Dan Schneider, uh, this is specifically for Professor Suzuki. Uh, you refer to countries of concern that will be target of economic security measures. What is the definition of that? And which countries are now, um, which nations are now included as a country of concern? Right. Um, so perhaps I should start. Um, uh, let me just uh, answer to the last question. The country of concern can be can be varied and changed according to the time. Currently, it's definitely China, but. Uh, uh, the Russia is now added to the list, and, and uh, there are a number of countries of concerns, for example, Iran, or, you know, uh, countries like Syria, or, or you know, th th these are sort of a flexible concept, and, uh, and it is uh, just placed in the, in the legal documents, just in case that if there is a change of the, the international environment. Um, the South Korea as an alternative, yes, Japan has a quite a, a extensive relationship with uh, South Korean semiconductor uh, industry, but perhaps you may recall that the, in 2019 that Japan has changed the, semi, uh, the export control rules to limit, or well, not limit, but to change the uh, 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 licensing procedures for the export control of the certain items such as the um, hydroxyfluoride, um, and uh, these are the cases that uh, that creates the tension between Japan, uh, Japanese industry, and the South Korean industry. But perhaps you know, apart from the national relationship. By the way, there is a new president coming in for the South Korea today. And uh, this new president is more uh, uh, forthcoming to the uh, relationship, uh, you know, uh, improving the relationship with Japan. So there is an expectation that, you know, the political relationship is going to be better. And there is the, uh, I mean, the, apart from the political relationship, the economic, I mean, economic integration between Japan and South Korea is very significant. And the, there is a lot of, you know, mutual dependency on the Japan and China, uh, the Japan and South Korea. So um, yes, if there is the, I mean, the Taiwanese semiconductor industry has it, uh, its importance, but it's, you know, uh, uh, the problem is the question of the uh, the size of demand and supply, and the supply is limited. The demand is huge, and even if the uh, even something happened in Taiwan, then it's almost impossible to replace the suppliers. The the amount of supply that the TSMC and UMC is pro providing to the global market, not only Japan but to the global market. So I think the South Korean uh, suppliers, uh, Samsung, et cetera, is not enough to, to, to substitute the entire capabilities of the supply chain, uh, supply capacity of the of the Taiwan. So anyway, the whole, whole world will face problem if there is something happen between China and Taiwan. The <clears throat> Government support, I think Mireya has already mentioned about the supply chain uh, support, uh, supply chain subsidies to, to diverse, you know, the Japanese government, METI, has, uh, has launched two programs. It, it was a pilot program, but it was to, to test, the, test the water whether the Japanese companies will be interested in diverse, you know, diversify their production site uh, from China. And there was uh, um, uh, uh, governmental subsidies uh, to support that. But uh, the fact is that 
it didn't really work as it expected to be. So uh, the, the, the subsidy is just one, one chance, one off, uh, 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 one off money, but uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, having the, um, having the supply chain and having the uh, production site in China has the longstanding, you know, creates the longstanding advantages of the, of their businesses. So it's, it's extremely difficult for changing the preferences and the economic calculations of the, uh, of the businesses to uh, to change their um, uh, change their minds to to shift from uh, production side from China to other countries, so reshoring is not really uh, of uh, of su successful. However, uh, in in other cases, the, you know Japan is now preparing to reshore the um, semiconductor industry from Taiwan and uh, from United States and et cetera. So there are, uh, it's not an economic nationalism per se. It's not the Japanese co companies which are supported by the government. But ag again, as Mireya said, this is a, about the question of location and whether to invite the Japan, Japanese as well as foreign companies to, uh, to produce in Japan. And, and that is considered to be as the uh, improvement of the resilience. So uh, Japan is preparing for the uh, 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 amount of uh, 800 billion yen for the, uh, uh, for oh, 600 billion yen for the, uh, as a subsidy for uh, supporting the production in Japan. If I, if I can um, jump in here, um, you know, on the China uh, ongoing diversification question, I would say that um, the, the Japanese and the American private sector, neither one wants to give up the Chinese market, right? It's still a very vast uh, uh, economic opportunity, but I do think that the calculus is shifting for a number of reasons. Um, one has to do with... Um, you know, the more uh, economic security um, uh, export controls are tightened and uh, China also embarks on its own um, uh, self-sufficiency efforts and it's now uh, putting forward the regulations of its um, uh, foreign sanctions uh, countermeasures. Uh, my point being that internationalized, internationalized business is increasingly uh, in a very uncomfortable place because it's going to be very difficult to uh, uh, serve uh, the regulations and comply with the regulations of many of these governments because they are aiming at each other. And I think that that's going to also be uh, um, uh, pr promote change for some of uh, um, how these businesses are conducted. I also think that China is, is becoming, um, you know, with its zero tolerance to COVID, its harsh lockdowns, with the changes to the regulatory environment, there are also things that China itself is doing that is changing the cost benefit calculus for some uh, business uh, sectors. So it's not only about the economic security agenda, but also what China itself is doing on these um, other fronts. Now on the Korea question, um, you know, and, and Dan Snyder, by the way, who asked the question earlier, uh, wrote an excellent piece on Japan, um, uh, ROK relations and the difficulty to overcome some of the historical issues and the wartime uh, uh, forced labor cases currently um, uh, with rulings from the Korean Supreme Court and so forth. But, um, you know, I think that uh, there's an opportunity uh, because of the arrival of uh, the new president, uh, Yoon, and I think that there is a greater desire to have a more functional relationship with Japan. I, you know, that's already um, uh, some progress, but a lot needs to be sorted out. I think that when it comes to trusted supplier um, networks, this could be an opportunity so that a path is found to uh, enable both countries to again relist each other as part of their white list and to think about how we actually could have um, uh, greater cooperation when it comes to the semiconductor supply chain. But that will only happen if there is a political will to make this uh, um, take place. 
And the other interesting element here uh, is, of course, that South Korea now seems very close to announcing, finally, there's been a lot of signals along the way that they would like to join the CPTPP. And I think that, again, is an important opportunity. Japan is obviously a, a leading country on the CPTPP and uh, taking a, an enlightened uh, approach and trying to uh, use this as another way to create a common agenda, convergence of interest might be beneficial um, because again, it makes all the sense for you know, consolidated Asian democracies, allies of the United States who care about rules-based order to be cooperating more closely. Wonderful, thank you. Those are uh, very astute observations um, and great answers to those questions. Um, another sort of cluster of questions have to do with uh, science and technology. Um, and there's a number of questions on that. Um, one is from um, um, Miku Yamada-san about how um, in Japan, historically, there's been some um, allergic reaction on the part of, especially academia, um, uh, against the use, you know, dual use kind of technology. There's always this suspicion that uh, those things are for military purposes and, you know, once they see that, they tend to react against it. And, and do you think there's a shift in, in this thinking regarding the dual use uh, research and technology? And there's more, more willingness to work with the government on this topic on the part of academia uh, and also private sectors. Um, another related question um, is from Kristin Vekasi again uh, about how these the science and technology issues um, might be just about university defense collaborations or th do they have more, to, uh, something a little bit more uh, to do with the supply chain resilience aspect of it? Um, that's a question from Christine Bekasi. And Kenji Kushida um, asks about this concern uh, about Japanese government um, measures of pursuing economic security just leading to exercising protectionism. Uh, in, especially in areas such as cloud computing, where domestic isolation in the name of security to protect domestic big IT firms can lead to a sort of Galapagos situation that will cause many Japanese firms um, to be left behind in global competitiveness. So these bunch of, bunches of questions um, about um, science and technology aspect of economic security. Um, if you could maybe start with Mireya this time. Um, sure. Um, you know, just very general observations. Um, I, I'm not sure yet that there has been this uh, shift in the, the willingness of academia to be more comfortable in participating on these defense uh, projects. I think that perhaps that's the intention here, and that's one of the pillars of the bill, but whether this actually, how this actually plays out uh, remains to be seen. And this is, I think, a sensitivity, a legacy that is, has manifested in other areas. Um, you know, you think about the state secrets law and the controversy that that created. And I think that because of um, you know, some wartime legacies, the public still very concerned about um, uh, moving forward with greater uh, integration. Um, so again, I, I probably defer to Suzuki Sensei uh, since he follows these uh, more closely. Um, in general, where this could morph towards protectionism, yes, quite frankly, and that's my concern. Um, there are robust, legitimate reasons to increase the defensive, um, the shield, if you will, of U.S. foreign economic, of Japanese foreign economic policy. There's strong uh, uh, benefits from having greater coordination, convergence with the United States and other like-minded countries. There are clear cases of economic coercion coming from China, and we haven't even gotten to the discussion as to whether there's something effective that we can do vis-a-vis -vis these acts of uh, economic uh, coercion uh, or not. Um, but I also feel that once you give the government this discretion, um, again, uh, if we don't have uh, sufficient safeguards, then the problem is that some companies will uh, receive the subsidies, but not others. And um, again, we have to be vigilant that this does not result in a loss of competitiveness and that this does not create uh, friction. 
Um, I had an event at Brookings uh, last week and we had some um, diet members and we were having a discussion on the term of industrial policy. And some people in the panel were saying it's a bad word. Some people were saying it's no longer a bad word. And my comment there is it's a loaded word in the US-Japan agenda because industrial policy in the past used to be uh, a source of friction. Now, of course, this is not the 1980s or 1990s. The world has shifted. And the US and Japan actually seem to be moving closer when it comes to the defensive economic measures. But you cannot uh, um, be complacent that this could not later on create some uh, frictions, not only vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China, but also among uh, allies. So again, uh, that's why, um, you know, I come from, I cut my teeth, so to speak, on Japan's economic statecraft on the connectivity side. I understand the strong rationale for the economic security side, but I also want us to proceed carefully to make sure that we don't um, uh, create a system where it's very easy to protect industry and invoke national security. Thank you. Susan Sensei? Right. Um, well, first question on the academia and the dual use issue. Yes, I, the, there are some remaining residual uh, problem between the link between the military and the academia. And there are still um, universities are uh, still hindering from uh, cooperating with the Ministry of Defense. But uh, I think the mood is generally changing, um, I, uh, largely not because there is an eagerness of the academia to participate in the, in the dual use technology programs, but I think it's because of the lack of funding. And uh, the funding from the Ministry of Defense seems to be, uh, you know, uh, for, for some, uh, some research area the funding may be uh, very useful and uh, it, it, it is a very big incentive for the academia to, to, to cooperate with the Ministry of Defense uh, to that extent. And I think this current uh, discussion about the, you know, uh, the promotion of the science and technology in the uh, economic security bill is partially the detouring of the channel between the direct the direct talk between the Ministry of Defense and academia, but through the economic security bill, the cabinet office will uh, play on behalf of the Ministry of Defense to promote the um, dual use technology. So I think this is a sort of a, you know, diversification of the threat from the, uh, from the academics point of view. The second point, uh, again, I think, um, uh, there are uh, there are certain uh, suspicions uh, for the, uh, the the collaboration with the defense, but um, uh, I, I think the question implies that there are questions between the supply chain resilience and uh, and promotion of the science and technological base. Uh, the problem is that the current bill of the economic security is a compilation of the many bills or many ideas. So. Some of those are not directly related. And the promotion of the science and technology is one thing that is uh, to, uh, to, to facilitate the uh, promotion of the dual use technology, whereas the supply chain is a different issue, but it all connected as the, you know, under the concept of the security. So the, uh, the chapters in, in the bill are not exactly, you know, uh, have the sort of a, you know, a, a, a synchronized uh, theme in, uh, among them. It's, a, it's generally a compilation of the different ideas. So uh, if there is no direct uh, relationship, that's not surprising. The finally, the, the protectionism, I, I, I have a little, um, different view from Milea that uh, this uh, economic security bill is carefully crafted to avoid to be a protectionist and uh, try to uh, make a distinction between what is crucial and what is not. And although there is a ambiguity remain in between those, you know, define the definition of which are the critical items and critical infrastructure, but still, I think there is an effort made to make a distinction between the 
uh, of, uh, this is where you can do the free trade and make sure that you know it's not fall into the uh, protectionism. And this is where that you know some sort of an, uh, protectionist measures allowed. So uh, I, I think uh, Kio has mentioned about the rice. Rice has been a good example that this has been the you know always the item of protection for many many years after World War II. And uh, it has been exempted during the gap period, and even after the uh, uh, even after the establishment of the WTO, uh, you know, rice is still the sort of a highly protected items because it is critical for the Japanese uh, food security. So, <laughs> so I think uh, these items are now narrowed down to the five items in the agriculture, and um, and perhaps that in the same way that there are some items which are narrowly defined, that these are the critical items that needs to be protected. And, uh, and in that sense, yes, it's a, it's a part of the pro uh, protectionist measures, but it's not entirely, you know, the Japanese trade policy itself becomes as, as, a, as a, a protectionist. By the way, uh, Japan doesn't have the uh, significant uh, domestic crowd vendors, and uh, we, we, you know, even the government is using the Amazon uh, Amazon services. So basically, we don't have anything to protect in the cloud computing, and basically, you know, it's uh, it it we struggle to have the. Uh, 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 something to protect. So at, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not I, I'm not suspecting that there will be any protectionist measures for for the cloud computing. Good. Um, what you just said is very reassuring, and I, I think it um, uh, addresses Miku Yamada-san's question about how Japan um, now you know one of becoming a champion of free trade in the region. Um, how how does Japan balance that? self-identity and these new measures of economic security. But, um, but I think this um, uh, list of critically, um, strategically critical items is going to be reviewed and renewed uh, okay, every year or so. So there is a potential, it seems to me, that uh, Miria's concern would come back at some point in the future. So there, it, there might be a need for us to monitor closely what's going to be included in that list. Um, I mean, if you want to add something to that point, that would be great. But also, uh, I want to integrate this question from Madarame Tetsuji-san um, about energy uh, security, because a lot of discuss uh, our discussion today about economic security is about semiconductor and all the technology and, and the new things. Um, whereas in thinking about economic security, the old um, conversation had, had a lot in Japan. Uh, had everything to do with energy, oil import, and so on. Uh, where does it fit uh, in the conversation today? Uh, is I think Madara Amazon's question. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to sneak in one more question from Christine Vacassi about um, offensive so economic security measures. Um, she, well, there's a perception that uh, what Japan did against South Korea, that Suzuki has just described, was a um, sort of offensive measure of economic security and Japan now is um, um, doing sanctions against Russia that's also kind of an offensive scheme. But most of our discussion about economic security uh, coming, or coming from Japan is about defensive uh, measures. So um, what do you see happening in the future? Is Japan going to use more offensive, uh, like weaponizing, participate in weaponization of trade? It seems unlikely, but I'm, I'm not sure. So if you could share your views on where this offense defense balance is going, that would be great. So it's the last round of questions. So if you could go quickly, that'd be great. So it, it seems uh, I, I, I shall start. Um, so uh, um, j just to uh, come back to this critical, um, strategically cr critical items. Um, I, yes, it, it, it is of course uh, need to be monitored. And I think, you know, as a, as a expert and I think, uh, Minera and uh, Kio is also as a as an outsider. Everyone needs to monitor, but it, it's it's an open document. But I, I 
I still have uh, some trust in the Japanese democracy and uh, and, and the Japanese opposition party who loves to, to criticize the government is going to monitor anyhow. So uh, I think there will be a certain, you know, uh, a limit to be set on the uh, uh, on this uh, uh, selection of the critical items. Um, in terms of the energy security, the reason why energy security is exempted from the uh, economic security bill is because that it already has the uh, economic security, energy security bill in the other, you know, other set of the bill, so it doesn't have to repeat in the same bill. Um, so the current discussion, food and, and energy is exempted, but because, not because it's not important, but because it's already there. So. This is a new additional measures which are already existing uh, in, in the security of the supply of food and energy. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's why it's not uh, exempt, you know, not, that's why it's not uh, appeared on the, on, on the bill and on the discussion. Uh, in terms of the South Korean uh, case, uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, the 2019 was the sort of a tricky uh, offensive measures because it was initially designed as the question of the export control. Uh, because of the uh, lack of the export control measurement in uh, in the in the South Korea, and because of that, Japan has changed its uh, export uh, licensing measures, licensing uh, quick criterion to uh, to South Korea. So that was effect effectively uh, means that the the uh, it was an aggressive. Uh, measures, but uh, it was technically uh, a technical uh, administrative issues. So it was a sort of a not directly employed as the uh, uh, aggressive measures uh, or offensive measures. Um, it was uh, it was very technical uh, uh, arrangement for the uh, for for the export control um, uh, technical export control issue. Um, I don't think there'll be uh, uh, any future that we will be able to do or uh, take offensive measures. Yes, we are doing the uh, sanctions on Russia, but again, as I said, the Japanese sanctions are all done under the international cooperation. So without the international, uh, uh, international decisions at the G7 level or the UN Security Council level, uh, it's still difficult to launch the um, domestic uh, or the unilateral uh, unilateral measures for the aggressive uh, uh, aggressive economic statecraft, and uh, and I think it remains to be so for the foreseeable future. Thank you, Maria. Um, sure, just very briefly, would there be another instance similar to the 2019 um, tightening of the export controls, uh, especially on some products where Japanese firms had dominant market shares and therefore uh, there was a strong concern in South Korea about how that would impact their own uh, competitiveness? I mean, you can never say never, but I think that uh, if you look at the consequences of that uh, use of influence, of leverage, I think that maybe that would discourage a repeat um, uh, episode. And by this, what I mean is that, you know, when you um, apply that leverage in the supply chain, the supply chain adjusts. And uh, you can impose cost on others, but you also have to refer to absorb some cost. And uh, Japan did uh, absorb some cost in the sense that some Japanese firms lost market share in uh, South Korea. And the South Korean government then became much more motivated to launch a major subsidy program for its own uh, semiconductor industry. So again, in the supply chain, when we talk about broadly speaking, the weaponization of economic interdependence, the point is that we're talking about interdependence and therefore the costs are not just on one side. And I think that there were some important lessons from that uh, episode. Wonderful, thank you so much to both of you for this very stimulating and insightful discussion. Um, I, I think um, Toshi Nakayama would approve of um, our conversation. Um, to Toshi, uh, rest in peace. And thank you, Kana-san, for uh, all the logistics for this session. And um, I hope that this is an important topic that will be relevant for many years, perhaps decades. So I hope we'll have another chance to 
come back and discuss uh, those issues, perhaps next time, hopefully, in, uh, on campus at Stanford. Um, but for today, thank you, Suzuki Sensei, and thank you, Mireya, uh, for, your, for sharing your um, expertise and insights. And until um, next time, take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.